uh, it's time for the next talk from Henry uh, Bolton. So he's from San Francisco State University. He will talk about our periodic column tree method. Actually, I, it's new also for me. Uh, please start sharing and have the floor. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, can you see? Yes, it's in full screen mode. Okay, thank you. All right, so I wanna thank the organizers for uh, letting me uh, talk about this. Um, so, and this talk again is more on classical, classical MD or n body interactions. So the cost here is order n squared, not n cubed, uh, the naive cost. Um, I want to acknowledge support from AOCF. Um, I used Vesta, which I think it's no longer in operation um, for uh, some of the parallel stuff. <clears throat> okay. Uh, So a lot of, I, all of what I'm going to talk about is in uh, the paper below here. Um, this is going to be just a simple preview. Um, and then there are more details in the paper. I try to give you an overview. Um, so the goal here uh, is to present this tree algorithm um, and, and show how it competes with particle mesh world. Uh, and then I'll show some tests, one test really, in the comparison to uh, PME. Okay. So, of course, as I said, I'm talking about, um, I'm working on this on n body interactions and um, specifically computing the Coulomb energy. So you, you, there's been sort of these things uh, in the past two, three days. And so Aurora Clark talked about um, long range interactions, which is of course a Coulomb energy is a long range, uh, a Coulomb kernel is a long range kernel. And then the tree code, you, um, you can talk, you can look at it as a fast multiple method, uh, sort of a first order fast multiple method. And I think Edmund um, Chow uh, talked about it a little bit with a hierarchical clustering approach. So the idea here is to compute, compute um, the electrostatic energy of a system efficiently. And of course, there's the naive way of doing it, which is order n squared. And then there have been several developments over the years. And there's the P3M particle, particle, particle mesh method. Um, and then there's of course PME, which, uh, a lot of codes would use PME as a fast multiple method, depending on how you look at it, it's n log n or order n. Um, and there's the particle um, the bounce hat tree code. Um, and then there's a cluster particle tree code that um, Deng and Driscoll and myself and Robert Krasny worked on. But all of these things have the same idea. Uh, you, you have some interactions and you are going to break it up into a near field that you're going to do very accurately and a far field that you're going to approximate. And so the far field, um, you can use a multiple approximation, a fast multiple or a tree code, or you can use um, these sort of interpolation algorithms and that can take off the multi-level method or you can think of PME. Okay, so specifically, I, I am concerned about, uh, or this work is concerned about electrostatic interactions in a periodic boundary condition. So here's a toy, a toy example. Uh, our, our net charge in the system is zero. These are particles, the net charge in the system is zero. And this is the um, Coulomb 
Coulomb sum periodic boundary condition. Okay, so this n here is periodic periodic images of that, and of course this goes up to infinity. Okay. And the classic approach, e word sum, is to sort of um, rewrite this sum here into an absolutely convergent sum, or two absolutely convergent sum plus some constant. So you would douse your um, your charges. You can look at these as charges with a background charge, and you would douse it, you cover it with a Gaussian, and then take out the Gaussian that you added to it. When you do that, the um, this cell here, this um, Coulomb sum, you can rewrite it as um, a sum in real space and a sum in reciprocal space, and then some constant term. And this is here, this here we call the structure function, the structure factor. And so um, the e word sum, of course, this is dominated, this is what we call the e word sum, and it's dominated by the real space sum and the reciprocal space sum. But we can control the decay rate of these two sums. So here I'm just showing the two sums, the real space and the reciprocal space. And the parameter alpha controls the rate at which this decays. So if alpha is really small, the reciprocal space decays very quickly and the real space doesn't. But if alpha is big, the real space decays very quickly. So here is a plot. Um, with that you can see alpha 1.5, a very quick decay of the real space and a slow decay of the reciprocal space. So what PME, you can decide what you want to do, where you want to shift the work. You can actually um, sort of try to balance the work between both sides and you would have an order into the three house method. Um, but PME, what PME would do is it will pick a large alpha so that this real space would decay very quickly. So you can compute it in order n or in constant time and actually. And, um, and then you, you, this part here of course is in a naive computation is order n squared. But what, you, what PME does is interpolate this, um, this uh, structure factors on a grid and then you use an FFT to do the um, computation. And so in the end, you get an order, order uh, and log n method. So I should say that um, this is, this is, I've worked on a few, well, I used to work on DL poly, um, which is also another simulation code uh, in, along the veins of lamps and gromax. And um, the PME was sort of a, the, the time consuming part in parallel. And that's sort of the, that is the motivation for this work um, because we know the FFT is excellent on a, a small cluster size. But then as we get onto large size of um, large clusters, the FFT um, performs poorly because of uh, communication, the communication of it. So the goal of this work was to say, okay, can we, can we find a way to get around this um, this um, decay uh, in the uh, performance of the FFT. Okay, so I'm going to present to you the uh, the tree algorithm. Um, this is you might have experience with this if you've read about the fast multiple method uh, or the uh, balanced heart tree method. So the the idea is to hierarchically um, divide your simulation system. So we have this system of um, particles, interacting particles, and all we're going to do is we're going to split it, we're going to make an arc tree, uh, divide it into an arc tree, and we're going to keep dividing until, so we have a top level tree, and we'll divide it into eight, and then we divide, that would be the next level, and then we divide each of those eight boxes or cells into another eight. And we can keep dividing, but we would stop at a point, we would sort of certify, um, provide a number where 
if if a cell has that number of particles, at most that number of particles, we stop dividing. So here is the first level. This is of course in two D. We have this system, the level zero, and then we divide that, and then we divide the cell again as a level two, and you can keep going. Okay. So here you can say, okay, we stop dividing when the number of particles in the cell is um, three. And that is how we define our, um, that is how we get a near field and then the far field. So here we're doing a particle cluster interaction. We divided our systems into clusters. And so we might have a cell like this and it'll have a center, it'll have particles in there, it'll have a radius. And then we'll do a particle that's not in the cell interacting with the cell or the cluster. And so we have to decide what is the uh, near field and the far field. And the way we decide is by this, this is called the multiple acceptance criteria. So little r over big r, little r of course is the radius of the cluster and big r is the distance from the particle interacting with the cluster to the center of the cluster. When that is bigger than theta, we say we are in the near field. And when it's less than theta, we see in the far field. Okay, this is all informed by um, previous analysis. I should say this is one form of the tree code. Um, there are other forms as well. So how exactly does the uh, algorithm work? So you might have that and you might say, okay, this particle here is going to interact with everything here. And then we have to ask, well, is that interaction in the near field or the far field? And you could see, okay, um, well, the distance from the particle to the center of this box is certainly smaller than the radius of the box. And so of course this big R, little r over big R is gonna be uh, greater than one. And theta is, um, has to be less than one. And so this is going to fail. And so the particle interaction will go from interaction with level zero to interactions with clusters in level one. And then we ask the same question again. Um, okay. So, okay. um, so we, we, this particle interacts with the whole system and then it fails this interaction. So maybe then it goes on and interacts with this cluster and then it adds is this interaction between this particle and this cluster here a near field or the far field? If it's near field, then it goes and asks its children. But if it's far field, then it interacts um, using a, an approximation, a multiple approximation. Okay. All right. So how how um, how does the approximation go? Okay. Um, so we have this particle interacting with this cluster, and this is an, the approximation is just a p for that Taylor polynomial approximation. So we are taking a multi-dimensional Taylor approximation here. Uh, we just take derivatives of the kernel, and this kernel, of course, is just the one over our kernel that we have um, for this particular problem. It can be any other kernel, um, any other decaying kernel. Okay. And so here is just a multi-dimensional Taylor series. Um, the goal isn't to go through it. I just want you to see a little bit of the um, computation that goes on. Okay. And when we write this, we can collect, we can collect these terms here. We can collect, um, We can collect these terms here with the uh, the charges over there okay, into what we call the moments. Okay. So I want to point out that the moments here uh, they only depend on the properties of the cluster. They don't depend on the particle interacting with the cluster. Okay. And so when we build our tree, we we for each moment. For each cluster, we can compute its moment and store it. 
And of course, when you're doing MD, you're going to be, well, all the particles are interacting with all the other particles. So when a particle interacts with a cluster, it, need, it will need to uh, do this computation. It's going to need this moment here. But once we store this moment, we can use it repeatedly. That's one time saving feature of, um, of, the, of the tree code. So we compute the moment. And then whenever a particle interacts with a cluster, it's only the only real um, computation we're doing is computing these Taylor coefficients here, right? which are really just that. And so in the process of building the tree, we compute the moments and store them so we can use them repeatedly. So the P here is the order of approximation. Um, and that is, that is going to, of course, affect the accuracy of your computation. And you, the user gets to decide what order of P you want to use. In the first instance of the tree code, the bounce heart, the P was just a zero order approximation. Um, okay. And of course, if we're doing MD, we need to be able to take forces. And so we can take forces, uh, derivatives of the, um, of the of the Taylor approximation as well. And that's what you get. And again, the derivatives only, they hit the, the um, Taylor coefficients, not the moments, because you're taking derivatives in X, not with the Ys in the cluster. So again, we have the moments there and we can get the, the forces that we need. So these Taylor coefficients here, there's a recurrence relation. We can derive a recurrence relation. This is a recurrence relation for the one over R kernel. Um, there are recurrence relations for other kernels that we can use. Okay, so I've, I've actually already gone through this, but um, I, can, uh, I can do it again. So the, here's the algorithm in, in free space, really. So you have your, you input your set of interacting particles, X, with your charges. There are N of them. So that's the particle data. And then you give the algorithm the, um, the theta you want to use, the map. So the smaller theta means that, oh, okay, you're being very stringent. And um, you're probably going to have more of the near field and the far field. And so you'll, you have higher accuracy, because that means it's going to take a longer, a longer time. Okay. You have to give a N naught, which is telling the system or the algorithm divide until the leaf has N naught particles, and then you, you stop. So then you construct your tree and you compute the moments of each cluster during this tree interaction. And then you just loop over um, the particles. And then you compute the interactions of a particle with the root of the tree. You compute this interaction. And so then you call your Mac and you say, oh, is the Mac satisfied over here? If it's not, well, if it is, then compute the interaction between particle I and the cluster using multiple approximation. Else, if the Mac is not else, well, if the cluster is a leaf, compute the interaction using direct summation. Else, well, compute the interactions with each child of this particular cluster. I should say, so I, I, I multiple approximation here. This is one choice. There's been developments now where okay, you don't have to use a multiple approximation. You can use, you can just use some polynomial, um, three-dimensional polynomial approximation of the, um, of your potential in the, in the cluster. So there are other forms of uh, approximating this interaction. It doesn't have to be a multiple approximation. So this is, um, I label this free space, and this is when you have your interactions, your um, in just a fundamental box. So that's not a periodic, a periodic um, tree code. That's just the fundamental box, and you're just doing doing the interactions of the particle in there. So, um, what of the periodic tree? I want to take you back. We started out saying that this is this is what we wanted to compute, and the sort of standard way of doing it is 
the e word sum. Okay, so we we rewrite this conditionally convergent sum into two absolutely convergent sum and uh, a constant term. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, and then PME will just use FFT for the reciprocal space. Okay. So this particular project here, we are trying to not to do PME. And so the goal is to actually compute the sum here. Okay. This here, this N here goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. but we, we are going to cut it off. So this is pretty much the, uh, the same idea as the free space tree code that I just presented. So this is our fundamental cell. Everything I've talked about about the tree code is, refers to this cell here. Now we are going to loop over all the images. So this is the cell replicated in space. And then you can imagine, oh, so this is the first level nearest neighbors. Okay. And then you can imagine having more and then even more uh, neighbors. And so this one here, of course, you can, we can just refer, we go to, uh, this is a minus one, this is a plus one okay. in X and then minus one plus one in Y. Okay. So you can imagine in 3D, we go from minus one to to one in all three dimensions, okay. So what we are doing here is, okay, so we have this system and we are going to replicate it in space in order to compute this, uh, this object here. And um, what we'll do, this particle, let's say, let's take an example, this particle here interacts with everything here, but then it has to interact with everything out here and everything further out. So this particle wants to interact with this system here. But I want you to see, um, note that the periodic images are just the fundamental box shifted. And so the, the, the tree, because we are doing a tree code, the tree for this fundamental, this image or the images are really the same as the tree in the fundamental box. Nothing is changing. And so the clusters here are the same as the clusters there. And so the moments over here are really the same as the moments here. If you look at it, our moments, of course, we computed as the center of the cell minus the particles, the position of all the particles mm -hmm, to some power. Okay, that's the case moment. Mm -hmm but we've shifted all of the um, particles by some um, constant amount. And which is of course a, um, the, the vector of the periodic image, the shift, and then L, which is a box length. But we, we, we do this subtraction here. So they go away, the end also go away. And we get the same moment as we got from the, um, for the free space. Okay. So what is happening is we don't really, we don't really have to replicate this physically. We just have the fundamental box and we are going to um, build the tree in the fundamental box. And whenever we are interacting with periodic images, all we are doing is recomputing, um, just computing new Taylor coefficients. This is the centers that have changed. One time saving feature, of course, originally in the fundamental cell, when we interacted this, this particle with the whole cell, the interaction failed. Mm -hmm. As it failed, um, it wasn't a far field interaction. But now, of course, this particle here with this cell, this might fail because this distance, this distance of the particle to the center of the cell is not as big, um, it's not that big, much bigger than the radius of the cell. So this particle will interact with this, the next level of this cell, not the zeroth level. It will interact with the first level and then maybe even the second level. But that particle will interact with this whole cell here because it's very far from this, uh, this cluster or this, this, uh, this uh, image. And that is also another time-saving feature of uh, the periodic tree code. So the periodic um, Coulomb tree code is really just the tree code replicated in space. 
And then we use that to compute this. Okay. So here is some test and comparison to P and E. Um, the first test, so I, I, um, what I did was I incorporated this into DL Poly Classic. I don't know how many of you know about DL Poly Classic. Um, so DL Poly, of course, is uh, an MD simulation tool. It's with, uh, it does um, the, the one that is under active development uses uh, domain decomposition, but DL Poly Classic uses replicated data. Um, approach to parallelization. Mm -hmm. So here I'm just trying to look at the uh, structural and dynamical properties. And so we're just looking at SPC water. In the paper, there's SPC water, there's sodium chloride in water, and then there's uh, valinomycin in water. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to see whether we can replicate the structural and dynamical properties. So these are just parameters for, for MD. Um, there's of course the oxygen um, with its atomic mass and the charges and two hydrogen atoms. Um, there are constraints on the bonds. And of course there's a van der Waal, um, Leonard Jones potential between the oxygen. I think that's the choice we make for SBC water. Uh, and me. it's about 27 minutes. Oh, I completely lost track. All right. Okay. So um, thank you, actually. Um, and uh, that's the particle mesh E world. Uh, these are the parameters. And then the, uh, here's the periodic Coulomb tree. And we are just looking at um, the images minus one to one. So we're just looking at the nearest images, which is in through these 27 cells. And then multiple orders, this is the P, the approximation or the, uh, the polynomial order. So it's zero, two, and four. Okay. And the number of particles is 500. And the multiple as approximation is 0.6. Okay, so 500 particles in a leaf, that's what it is. Okay. So here is the structural property. Um, this is just radial distribution function, which is easy to reproduce as PME, and then the PCT, P equals zero, P equals two, P equals four. So zero third, second order, fourth order. And here is the, um, um, the velocity, velocity autocorrelation function. This is the center of mass. And this is the force, force autocorrelation function okay. for PME, which is the back one, and then for the PCT. And of course, we don't expect, the, the decay rate is the same. We don't expect the force false correlation to be the same. Um, it's slightly different potentials. All right, so here's the parallel scaling. This is running on Vesta. Um, here, this is up to 512, and these are up to 1024 processes. So here is where PME, the problem with PME, it, it works well, it's very good scaling until you get to 16 processes, and then it slopes. Um, it saturates over here. Mm -hmm. And here is the tree up to that. And then it's a slightly bigger system and a much bigger system. Over here. So we get sort of um, about two, two times speed up um, over here. We get about two times speed up over here, about four times speed up for a small system. But that's for uh, replicated data strategy, you, you typically are working on a, a system of this size or that size on 50,000 atoms. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, here are some numbers, but essentially over here, we get PME goes to 1.69, 1 1.61 seconds per time step, and PCT is 0.58. Uh, it, it's time step for an order zero approximation, order two approximation, order four approximation. We have that. And of course, this is if you're doing um, multiple time steps, millions of time steps, this is quite significant. Okay. Um, so here is, uh, I'm almost done. Here is um, 
the a comparison, why, why, why do you need periodic images? So this is just the structural properties and you see the, the zeroth here is when you don't have periodic images, the structural properties are way off. And then you can say, okay, when you have S equals one, which is the nearest neighbors and then S equals two, which is this next level and then S equals three, there is no difference, okay? which says that, okay, for this particular system, or for most of the systems, we look all the systems we looked at, S equals one, or just having the nearest neighbors is good enough. That's an efficient thing. Okay. All right, and so the extension is to, of course, uh, well, not, this is point multiples to work on point multiples. All we worked on now is point charges, but the goal is to apply this to point multiples where PME is even more time um, uh, time consuming. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, yeah, we're short of time, but I think we can still have one quick questions. Uh, anyone wants to ask questions? Okay, I can have a quick one. Uh, Henry, so a lot of material studies nowadays we we do quasi 3D system like uh, surface that is like uh, bulk and vacuum, a vacuum. For this type of system, uh, how these methods, the one that traditional use and how the one you proposed to gonna help? I mean, how, how this method works on this quasi, uh, quasi 2D systems? 2D system. Not pure D, not pure two D, but quasi quasi two D. It's like a material surface. You do MD simulation. Okay, so you mean you might be it's uh, sort of periodic in just two D. Yeah, a lot okay. of vacuums. Okay, all right. So that is actually so. Um, I, it's tough to handle that with PME. It's tough to handle that with PME. But it's very simple to handle uh, it with the with 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 um, this periodic tree code. Actually, that's one thing I didn't I didn't note. Um, yeah. So essentially, this n here, this is a, this is this is a parameter in the code, and you you tell the algorithm how it should. Um, how we should um, handle the periodic boundaries. So if you just want, let's say it's a 2D material uh, or only it's only periodic in X and Y, then your, your Z coordinate is fixed. And so in the code, you don't, you don't replicate in Z, you only replicate in X and Y and it, it handles it automatically. That is, that is one feature of um, this periodic Coulomb tree that I didn't talk about. Thank you for saying that, yeah. Um, so yeah, so in the sense quasi 2D materials, this, this will handle it well. Um, you can probably do it with um, PME, but it will take sort of a lot of work to... Uh, yeah, FFT hates vacuums, yeah. Yeah, but this one will work it, well. yeah, this one works well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, enter entering okay, another okay. break, so... Let's continue on the yeah on the on the coffee break room.